So good afternoon, folks. Thank you for tuning in to another Risk Institute online session. And today we're fortunate to have with us our very own Mr. Nicholas Gray, who will talk to us about his research on why risk and certainty are key for humane algorithms. Uh, the presentation will be around 45 minutes and 20 minutes of Q&A. So please could you make sure that your mics are muted? And if you'd like to leave any questions in the chat or raise your hand at the end of the session, we'll pick out people to, to ask questions. So before we begin, I'd like to make a few announcements about talks that we have coming up in the next few weeks. So next week uh, at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, we have our very own as well, Mr. Adolphus Lai, uh, and he'll be presenting to us about his research on probabilistic prediction of material properties with artificial intelligence um, using ProMap. Uh, the following week after that, we have Professor Bilal M. Ayub, uh, who will be talking to us about hazard resilient infrastructure including network topology and underground spaces as case studies. That'll be at 3 p.m. Um, on the 3rd of May, 4.30 p.m., we'll have Dr. Divya M. Pasuad from California. She's working in the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And she'll be talking to us about two, 2D and 3D imaging of planetary surfaces using remote data sets. Um, and then the following week, we will have one of our alumni, Dr. Sarah, I'm not going to even try to pronounce her last name because I'll get it wrong, but she'll be talking to us about her new research uh, working on rehoming dogs um, and risk assessment of dogs and dog bites and, and such, but she hasn't given us uh, her title yet. So I'll keep you updated with that. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce Mr. Nick Gray. He's a PhD student at the Institute um, of ours for Risk and Certainty at the University of Liverpool under the supervision of Scott Ferson. His PhD studies are multidisciplinary with research interests including machine ethics, uncertainty in machine learning and risk communication. So he's recently spent six months working as a research associate at Imperial College London, researching human in the loop uh, machine learning. But we've managed to kind of claw him back into the Institute and he'll be doing a presentation for us now. So if you'd like to start sharing your slides, Nick, and we'll begin. Yeah. Oh, I can't find the Zoom, there's the Zoom thing. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah, perfect, can see it fine. Okay, well, thanks for um, coming. And uh, I'm gonna start by apologizing because this presentation is a bit of a mess. Um, but, well, we'll, um, we'll get on. So the sort of, foundations for my work is this sort of idea about algorithms um, and the sort of personified sense of the word and um, sort of becoming more and more ubiquitous in everyday life so people um, have sort of started to um, begin to trust decisions that are made by an algorithm and people want to do things using their computers using their iPhones um, from sort of the simple stuff to sort of online banking to all sorts of things um, that people want to use computers, want to use this technology. And um, there's an irony of automation to all of this in the sense that sort of nobody really necessarily remembers directions to places anymore or what their phone number is because it's so easy just to use your smartphone for all that. Um, and there's this sort of danger that um, you sort of potentially sort of arising is that people sort of treating these algorithms as though they sort of their epistemic superiors that the algorithm must know everything and must um must be better and they're sort of replacing um people with algorithms um so just to sort of give a, a quick example of it you see sort of papers um like this the sort of yeah ai is going to come and is going to save the world um for covid 19 um, and this is just sort of picking up two papers that's entirely based on um, what the headlines were. So yeah, learning and sort of updating and to get a sort of a probability getting COVID-19. And if you look at the abstract, they say that their sort of um, system is a 94% um, success rate. Um, and again, using artificial intelligence for sort of chest x-rays to look at have they got um, COVID-19. And all this is very good, but then you see um, sort of articles like this um, that say a lot of these things are sort of poorly reported. 
um, and they are high high risk of bias and there's all sorts of problems associated with this um, this use of algorithms um, so that then comes on to the sort of concept of humane algorithms so if you, you take that sort of seminal piece of um, science fiction literature by Isaac Asimov then you have this sort of a, a robot may not injure a human or through inaction like you've been to come to harm um, when I was getting the precise quote um, for that this morning I thought it was interesting to note that that was written in 1950 um, but in the sort of universe of the book it's actually in 2058 and we're a lot closer to 2058 um, than when the text was written and yet there's clearly we're still struggling with that um, and I think in the present day that harm can be anything really from sort of annoyance um, to sort of injustice particular sort of criminal system sort of aggravation sort of catastrophic um, decisions that the algorithms make that sort of have life and death consequences um, so the sort of three things that if you look at the sort of machine ethics um, and AI literature um, that come up and I've sort of grouped them together. Um, one of them is this strand around workability, so robustness, um, sort of error handling, user friendliness, sort of accessibility, making sure that, yeah, you have, have the tools that work, that they work with um, sort of software and that people can use them well. There's this idea about fairness, Sort of, sort of transparency and um, explainability is becoming a big um, topic. This sort of idea of sort of unbiased decision making um, and sort of letting algorithms accommodate diversity. Um, and then there's also this idea of accountability, sort of the ideas of sort of data provenance. Where did the data come from? Why you're using it? Uh, making sure that privacy is sort of left intact. Um, sort of what assumptions have gone into the algorithm um, and the machine learning tool used, why have you done it? Um, in the sort of scientific literature especially, there's this idea of making sure that these sorts of simulations are repeatable, that somebody else will get the same um, result and the sort of accuracy, um, which I couldn't really think of a better word of, but the idea of is the algorithm actually doing what you want it to do? Um, if anyone's got a better word for that, let me know. But um, sort of moving through a few of these things. Um, so robustness, sort of in sort of machine learning literature, um, when they talk about robustness, they sort of generally come around to these sort of two ideas. It's the sort of ability to handle sort of incorrect or limited feedback um, and the ability um, of an algorithm to sort of generalize to unseen data. Um, in particular, without crashing, without causing a sort of catastrophic failure, if the algorithm is expecting a number between zero and 10 and you put in 750, um, is it going to blow up? Is it going to do something you shouldn't? How can you sort of make it robust against that, that mistreatment? Um, and this sort of idea of um, sort of robustness and getting the right answers out and sort of protection from that sort of goes right the way back um, sort of a lot further than you might imagine and um, sort of to the sort of 1860s. Um, so Charles Babbage came up with the difference engine, um, which is sort of a very, very early predecessor of a, of a calculator. Um, and when he was presenting it to the um, Houses of Parliament, he notes that somebody asked him this question, if you put the, the wrong numbers in, will the right, right answer come out? Um, sort of nowadays that's sort of considered in the sort of mantra of garbage in garbage out uh, making sure that it's uh, it's good and you get the right the right thing um, however in a sense in a in a lot of situations we're not we're not actually allowing ourselves to put the the right numbers in um, so I think everybody here is pretty much falls into the category of science and engineering um, and sort of in every calculation, units are sort of critically important um, to get the, the calculations right. And sort of failing um, with units can have sort of serious effects. So the um, sort of Mars orbiter was um, deorbited because there was a conversion error between NASA who were working um, in metric and the sort of suppliers of 
some of the parts that were working in Imperial units. Um, and they did the sort of conversion errors wrong and they weren't aware and it, and it crashed. Um, there was an Air Canada flight in the 80s that ran out of fuel um, midair because the pilots and the engineers were used to working with Imperial units um, and they changed over and fortunately they managed to glide the plane um, engineless um, to the ground safely. Um, perhaps sort of more sadly and more sort of person is that in the US sort of thousands of children um, have to go to hospital because they um, be given a drug overdose that's sort of associated with sort of making mistakes and um, again it's US and the lack of wanting to use the metric system but people looking at the, the bottle and saying well it, it is five um, and then I don't know milliliters and then they look at the okay so five and then think well it must be teaspoons and therefore giving massive overdoses um, and this happens yeah in the in the thousands um, a lot of the time these are considered as sort of human factors and sort of um, pushed into that that bracket but you could also say well why can't we sort of let the algorithms do the units that sort of us example if the parents aren't happy working um, in milliliters why not just give them it in units that they are comfortable working with um, sort of make it better that way and um, so to take that idea if you if you think about calculators um, again sort of nurses and pharmacists often make mistakes um, when dispensing drugs and it's sort of simple mistakes using a calculator um, and there can be ambiguous results if you need to work out that two plus three times four um, what answer is your calculator going to give is it going to give you 20 is it going to give you 14 um, depends on what the calculator is and you can also have typing errors so you can um, you if you're meant to put um, 1.01 and you forget the decimal place you've got um, sort of a hundred times more drugs than you might um, however people have designed calculators that can um, deal with these these simple errors um, and so they sort of look and go what what drug are you are you dispensing and you see you and then you do your calculation they look at it and sort of um as sort of an aware um of the what the risk is and what the risk of that particular drug is and if it's you get, if it gives a stupid number then it's sort of risk aware enough to go are you sure you meant that um so the authors of the, that paper um sort of give this um example and, and what they say is that if you look back to the 1900s the idea of washing your hands in hospital um in order to save lives seems stupid and people were skeptical that hand washing would help um in the same way people are skeptical that actually making these better calculators that are more risk of, um, aware could could help um why is it not um and again, there's this idea of also user friendliness. So making sure that the, the algorithms and the computer systems that um, we're using actually work for, for what we want them to do. Um, and so as an example of that, this is some research. And if you look at it, um, so one fifth of papers that are in the sort of gene um, biology domain, um, one fifth of them have got errors in um, Excel spreadsheets. Um, and what, what has happened is that the Excel has um, converted some, some names. So, for example, SEP2 and March 1 um, were names for um, different genes in the human genome. And Excel, if you type in SEP2, it thinks you're trying to put in September the 2nd, um, and same for March 1, um, and sort of other codes. So um, that sort of string, um, without sort of doing careful um data handling which isn't necessarily the easiest thing to do in excel um is sort of converted into a floating point number um and obviously that that's not what you want um however it's sort of it turns out that actually um rather than getting the biologists not to use excel it was easier to get the biologists to um rename the genes themselves 
um, because that sort of computer is so ubiquitous, so sort of ever present that actually it doesn't matter that it's not user friendly um, and isn't doing the right thing. It's uh, yeah easier to to rename the genome. Um, so again, on that on um, errors, uh, if anybody does any sort of coding, um, sort of often get things like this. Um, so you get sort of error messages that, that don't help and don't make sense. Um, and yeah, are, are sort of complicated and difficult to understand. Um, and that sort of poor error handling can have sort of um, quite catastrophic consequences. Um, so Therac was a radiography machine um, that was used in the 1980s. Um, it was able to perform sort of therapy with both electron and photons. Um, and six people received massive, um, like humongous doses of radiation um, by mistake. Two people died of the radiation poisoning. Um, and so how the system worked, so it had two modes of operation, sort of a low current, low energy electron, or you put some sort of filter there that would transform the electrons into X-rays at a higher current. Um, the problem becomes if you have that high current, um, high energy electrons sort of give a, a radiation burn if it's there. However, the, the coders came up with a way of sort of making it safe so that people would put in what they want and so they want X-ray mode. And they would have this code where it's, okay, so we start off at assuming it's not safe. And then we essentially go through and sort of check, okay, is it safe um, or not? And if it's, if it's not safe um, and we're saying safe to be zero, then um, don't fire the beam and instead print this error message, um, sort of error 54 which, okay, error 54, that sounds good. And you expect the people to look and see what's error 54. However, they sort of just ignore it and try and solve the problem themselves without actually looking what the problem is. Um, and then what this, this algorithm was prone to is sort of eventually overflowing back to safe as zero, sort of assuming that it's, it's safe, it's passed all the checks and the beam fires by, um, by mistake. Um, and the, there's sort of two, two problems um, with that one is the sort of algorithm problem of there's the overflow error um, and that's that's not not what we wanted um, but there's also a problem with the error message um, that it isn't really intelligible um, and isn't very very understandable and error 54 is the patient is about to die of radiation poisoning and if error 53 um, is oh you've put in you've not put in a value in one of the boxes then clearly those, those errors are more risk um, and sort of awareness of what the risk is and could possibly have helped. Um, but th this isn't necessarily an easy thing to do. So um, for example, the sort of this Air France crash um, that crashed into the ocean, um, the, the plane was fine um, until um, one of the sensors froze over and so the autopilot turned off. Um, the pilot was sort of left in control of this aircraft at 38,000 feet, and they weren't, weren't used to, to dealing with that situation. Um, and they sort of had conflicting reports, and they didn't, didn't know what to do. And the co-pilot and the pilot were trying to do different controls. Um, and so eventually, they stalled the aircraft, um, and, it, and it crashed into the ocean, um, sort of in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, and the, the sort of autopilot sort of just gave up um, when faced with a problem because that was sort of thought to be the best best thing to do. The sort of reverse of that is sort of the Boeing 737 MAX um, where it had a system on board um, designed to prevent the aircraft from stalling. Um, and there were sort of two crashes um, a couple of years ago and all the people um, on board died and it's this system that was blamed for both these accidents and there was all sorts of corporate malpractice behind the scenes but ultimately this this algorithm that the pilots thought they could turn off and sort of manually adjust this sort of algorithm never sort of let go of control and if you think about it that's sort of almost the, the reverse situation the algorithm never accepts that it's wrong and, and never gets 
um, uh, yeah, never sort of solves itself and, and works properly. Um, and so there's this sort of idea that actually, well, why, if we're getting uncertainty in, why not sort of actually just give the uncertainty out and then sort of be honest about what the, what the errors are and why, why it's failing. Um, so in a sense, the, the algorithm should be able to sort of accept that actually you don't, don't know. Um, and also the algorithm needs to sort of be able to communicate when it doesn't know in order to, in order to help the humans um, work and therefore it also needs to sort of fail in a risk averse way that makes the situation better um, and not worse so um, moving on there's this sort of idea of fairness that that everybody agrees is really really important um, however sort of looking and researching it you end up with this um, sort of systematic or this sort of circular Sort of definition that people say okay so algorithms are fair um, if they sort of mitigate the effects of bias um, and you define bias as being unfair decisions and then you sort of go okay so what's an unfair decision okay it's one that doesn't have bias but um, aside from that and the sort of definition problems with some of these terms then it's sort of important so sort of when it comes to fairness um, everybody sort of agrees that, that, that transparency is important. Um, so this is a picture of um, a sort of human breast tissue um, and it's sort of important to, to look at it and go, okay, so what's, is it a healthy tissue or is there a problem? The sort of arrows suggest that pointing out what the problem is. Um, and if you have this sort of, you came up with this sort of system with a really good sensitivity and specificity, and um, sort of similar to human pathologists, um, then you look and go, yeah, okay, that that's all well and good, um, but actually in this case, that that there isn't a sort of smart machine learning algorithm behind the scenes. There's a pigeon that's been trained to look at um, the pictures and gets the reward if it gets it right. Um, this is the the paper for that, um, and so you look at it, okay, so you sort of have these systems and people say, okay, I've got this, this wonderful machine learning algorithm. What is it? What is it? What is it? Um, and they don't really tell you. And it's not, not transparent about exactly um, uh, what the sort of who is, who is making that, that decision. Um, so there's sort of some questions you, you can think to ask. Um, so one is, is the algorithm working totally autonomously? Um, is it able to sort of take the input, do some processing and give you an output totally by itself? Um, and therefore there's sort of that sort of question there of a case of who's then responsible for if it makes a mistake, um, what is there? Or do you have these systems where actually you have a human um, supervisor there that is sort of perhaps sort of looking at all the, the decisions made by the algorithm and sort of picking out the ones, okay, I think these ones might be wrong. Um, let's look at them again. Um, or you, you also have systems um, where actually there is a, what is in the literature considered as a sort of an oracle. Um, so the human is there in the algorithm. If it doesn't know something, it can ask the human for help making a, making a decision. Um, and so this sort of idea again comes up in sort of aviation. So in, in aviation, the um, sort of humans are designed um, really within these autopilot systems. The human is a, is a supervisor. They should um, put, put it on autopilot and then be supervising the system. Um, however, that, that doesn't always happen. There's numerous cases of pilots sort of ignoring it or not necessarily knowing the example um, and sort of getting getting it wrong and making mistakes. Um, again, this idea of fairness, sort of bias comes up. Um, the sort of go-to example in everything is always this sort of compass algorithm, um, which is a logistic regression algorithm um, and has sort of lots of uh, racial bias problems. Um, so the accuracy itself is pretty poor um in sort of one sense but actually if you if you are black you're more likely to be a false positive and if you are white you're more likely to be a, 
a false negative. So here are some examples. In, in all these cases, the white person is a much worse sort of history and is given a, a lower a lower risk score. Um, and you can see that that plotted what the, the risk score is sort of for blacks and whites. So you see that big sort of spike at one. And again, you have you have these bias problems. I'm going to come hopefully come back to this um, a little bit later. Um, and also there's sort of this idea of explainability that's sort of becoming really popular. Um, and so so sort of the idea is that actually if you have uncertainty sort of in the output, it, it does give you a sort of avenue for appeal. So for example, if you have a, a system and you look at it and go, okay, well, well, I don't, the, the algorithm says I don't know, so therefore I need to go and get get more information about um, if, it, if it's the, the compass, I'm going to go and try and find some more information about the suspect to make a decision. Or um, if it's in medicine, it might be worth looking and going, oh, well, need, need more information to make a, a decision. Um, it sort of can also help to understand the results with expressions of confidence. And you're sort of beginning to see this, this trickle through. Um, sort of you get sort of systems that if you put in a search, it sort of saying that it's highly confident, it's one thing, or it's less confident, it's another thing. Um, and therefore that sort of does give more information um, sort of beyond a yes or no, if you have, have some uncertainty there. Um, and it, sort of, again, you have um, some di diversity um, as another sort of problem that, that comes up. Um, and so I'm just gonna give one um, little example of that. Um, sort of, I'll come, come back to this example later. Um, but so there's this paper they use sort of a logistic regression algorithm to model the risk of death after a burn injury. Um, it's also, there's other things that you can do that are similar. Um, and there's sort of a data set with, with sort of tens of thousands of samples, which is great. Um, however, there's, there's lots of missing, missing data and un uncertainty there that's often just thrown away. Um, and then if you actually look at, at what the features for their algorithm are, you get, you get this and you sort of look at it and the, the race one in particular stands out as, so it's sort of that saying, okay, so if you're white or you are not white, that's the, um, that's there. And it, it's not a very diverse way of considering the race, especially um, in a medical context. And of course, not everybody neatly fits into that category of white and not white. Um, and it's not a, not a particularly good thing to do. Um, so that then is sort of a, a, a list of issues. Um, and then so you can then think and go, okay, so um, if you, you buy that actually uncertainty is a sort of key component to all this, um, then it's important to compute with uncertainty. Um, and so there's sort of two, two types of uncertainty that you can work with. And I know this is a little bit preaching to the choir. Um, with this audience, but you have that sort of aleatory uncertainty, that sort of natural variability, um, and you sort of look at it and you sort of can roll the dice and you get a different number each time, um, or you get this sort of epistemic um, probability that I've tried to do a picture of Scott's dead fish in the night example, but I'm sure everybody's um, aware of. Um, and then there's un un some uncertain numbers that you can use, so you can sort of consider as intervals as actually if all you know is it's between two bounds, um, sort of between one and two, then actually the, it's an interval and you can, you can look at that and you can see it. Um, and then that sort of quite naturally characterizes the epistemic uncertainty. Um, and then you have probability distributions that sort of actually characterize that sort of natural variability. Um, if you roll a dice, the, the probability, if it's fair rolling a, a one is one in six and so therefore you can look at that and know okay so a six of the time I, I should expect one um, and they are p boxes which sort of bring the two together and allow you to compute um, with both the um, just types of uncertainty at the same time by having the, that sort of um, interval bounds on the, the probability distribution um, and then there's also c boxes that I'll get onto later um, 
so there's this um this paper that's by michael bolch that he gave a talk about two years ago now probably um and the idea is there's loads of satellites um and they all all fly away and as the um there we go the animation is now working the so sort of what is sort of noted in the literature is that actually there is a problem of them hitting each other, which can be catastrophic. And if you've seen the film Gravity, um, then it sort of clearly can be a problem. Um, and what people notice is that actually is the epistemic uncertainty about where the satellites are increases. Um, then if you sort of use probabilities to characterize the, um, the collision, then actually you sort of become more confident that actually everything's everything's going to be all right so if you have to have this sort of basic example and you sort of simplify the maths and actually you just have one satellite and various other satellites flying towards it um, if you know what the trajectory is then it's sort of quite easy to simplify the dynamics down um, and sort of say okay is one going to hit or is it going to is it going to fly by um, the the problem comes if there's um uncertainty so if you have this um orange satellite and you're unsure about what the the trajectory is not because it's it's sort of variable and the tra trajectory might change each time but actually you have an epistemic uncertainty about it um then what you get is that well all we can say is that actually the the most it can be and the the least it can be is somewhere within that interval um and then then it's sort of okay what can we do with that and so quite a, a popular thing to do is okay well we'll consider it as um as sort of monte carlo we'll consider it as a uniform distribution then we'll randomly sample um and then as you can see that okay it's precise we know it's going to hit um but then as the sort of uncertainty sort of that epsilon increases but actually the, the number of the sort of little satellites that hit the one we're worried about actually decreases. And over time, um, what you see is this sort of probability is sort of very slowly decaying sort of towards zero is just the this possible spread of where all the, the satellites are sort of go away. And this is what um, Michael Bolt considers the, um, the false confidence there and that actually we are getting falsely confident about the satellite not hitting and um, just because we've got so much uncertainty that we can just sort of ignore it we can stick our head in the sand and go well i don't know where it is so it's probably fine um, however if you characterize it with with intervals um you sort of okay so it's going to hit um but then once it possibly could miss instead you just get this zero one um this probability and that sort of stays forever so it doesn't matter how uncertain you are if it reaches a point um in which it's zero one and that's sort of caused by sort of characterizing that uncertainty using um intervals instead of um probabilities and sort of doing it doing it differently um and so that sort of computing sort of with the correct uncertainty um sort of matters and makes difference to give a sort of slightly more complicated example um, the attitude of a spacecraft is the direction in which it points. Um, and this is the whole list of equations um, that possibly affect what that is. And the, the sort of problem is that actually all these things are all sort of inter interrelated and there's often uncertainty about them. Um, this example is taken from a, a paper that um, was published this year, um, that's the citation, um, although the example actually comes from Scott's SRA workshop, but anyway. Um, and so if you look at, at some of these um, sort of values and what they are, is you can sort of look at it, okay, so the, the drag coefficient, okay, well that, the drag coefficient sort of changes depending on um, what the sort of angle of attack of the, um, the spacecraft is the sort of solar radiation can change depending on how much light it's in um, and there's various of the things the sort of yeah the surface reflectivity all these things could have uncertainty about them and do have uncertainty about them um, however you, you characterize as sort of key boxes and intervals and um, then you you can actually compute with these um 
things and you can compute with these uncertain objects and you get that sort of uncertain um, output out. Um, and sort of in this, this case, it's if you're in the sort of engineering design, you can look at that and go, okay, so you're going to need somewhere between zero and I don't know what that gets up to, a thousand maybe um, sort of thrust that might be needed in order to um, maneuver this, this rocket successfully. Um, and therefore you can use that, that uncertain information um, in your, your design. Um, again, sort of moving on to the, the next chunk. And um, if people came to the um, last talk I gave them, these slides can be very familiar, but anyway. Um, so I, this was a, a quote that I heard from someone and I can't remember um, who it was, um, nor would they probably, given that they gave it as sort of a site on machine learning, then it might not be the best thing to actually quote them on. But machine learning is mostly classification and regression. Um, when you actually sort of boil down and look at, at what, the, um, what the things that you're actually doing are. Um, and so an example of that is logistic regression, which almost merges the two. Um, it's sort of the, do you give a probability um, sort of using a sort of regression style um, of a variable having a binary outcome? Um, there's many applications, some of which the compass and the um, burn example I looked at before, but there's, there's yeah many, many, many different things in the literature. If you search it, it comes up in all sorts of places. Um, and so therefore it's sort of quite a key, key machine learning algorithm. Um, so yeah, if you have it, in a sense, you have some points that are zero, one, and you are trying to fit, um, fit this curve to them, and you are trying to find the, the sort of beta values that best best fit the curve um, and then you you can make sort of predictions from your machine learning model sort of by comparing the the output probability to some sort of chosen threshold um, sort of if it's greater than or lower than some value then you consider it to be high risk low risk um, whatever the sort of simplest is if you say okay if c is 0.5 then it's high risk if it's higher than 0.5 it's low risk than opposite but you could you could choose other values depending on what your risk appetite may be so for example if you are looking at a um, medical e example then you might sort of really want to say okay i want to reduce the number of false negatives as low as possible and um, so therefore i'm going to pick a c value um, that does that and then you can sort of well in this case sort of generate some data and then you can sort of calculate sensitivity and specificity once you've sort of selected uh, an example. Um, and then you can also look at the false positive rate, but because you're, you're varying that threshold value, um, what we're actually seeing is that actually you get um, what's called an ROC curve. Um, and so actually you just sort of select various different C values then you plot it. Um, and then you can look at this and go, okay, so, if it's sort of perfect, you'd expect it to sort of go um, only at all the points be at sort of one zero because it's false positive rate. So sort of everything is categorized correctly. Um, and if it's sort of guessing at random, you'd expect it to be um, at that dotted line. Um, so if you consider the uncertainty in all of this, then it's sort of fairly easy to sort of say that that sort of aleatory randomness um, is actually covered by sort of the standard logistic regression techniques. Um, however, the sort of epistemic uncertainty isn't, isn't really present. And if it is present in data sets, which it usually is either because stuff is missing or stuff um, isn't present, then actually you can, it's sort of often the case that it's thrown away or it's ignored or you make sort of assumptions um, in order to get it. However, it is possible to include if you sort of think of a sort of set of possible models um, that you can construct and you can, can sort of construct this sort of set of models by trying to find the values um, that correspond to sort of minimum maximum values for all the sort of beta zero, beta one, up to however many dimensions you have. If you find the sort of maximum minimum values of all of them, then you can find um, what it is. So to um, sort of take an example of that. If you have this case, then you've got all these interval data points. Then if you pick some 
a value from each of them, then you get line and if you shuffle these values round, then you can get different different bounds and different lines and sort of then what we're sort of trying to do is find the sort of most extreme values um, and then sort of consider the sort of imprecise model as the envelope of those boundaries. Um, and then I feel like I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip through some of this. Uh, and so if you have the sort of that imprecise model, you have sort of imprecise predictions there. Um, and sort of what you can do with that is you can consider, and why is that? That's the picture. Um, the sort of imprecise model is okay. So, well, based on the imprecise model, we know that between um, 178 and 204 of them are true positives and sort of et cetera. And you sort of can look at that and sort of work with it and sort of say, okay, that gives us sort of a sensitivity and specificity. And then you sort of can sort of look at that. The, the alternative thing to do is you could sort of leave them aside and say, okay, so actually there's 26 positive individuals that we, that we weren't able to make a prediction for. Um, what, what does that mean? Um, or you could sort of look at it, okay, so um, we can consider, well, out of those that we predicted were positive, how many um, actually were, and you sort of can look at, at that and, and sort of get these sort of different sensitivity and specificity values. Um, and then the sort of other thing you consider is the sort of incertitude, how many were you not able to predict? Um, and then, okay, so if, if you're happy that 10% of the uncertainty means that 10% of the predictions that you made, you perhaps couldn't be sure about which, um, whether they should be sort of predicted positive or negative, then sort of, well, you, you might want to think, think about it again. Um, and then sort of in the real world, um, you have, have all these um, sort of cases and the, the imprecision is there sort of at, at all times and both with sort of independent, independent variables. Um, you sort of can include that um, and sort of go sort of back a little bit to this sort of burn injury example. You sort of look at that, that data set, um, that was funky. Um, and then, okay, so actually the sort of missing data points are ignored in the original um, sort of analysis that these people did. Um, if you were, so the sort of way that the sort of data works is that if you're between zero and 80, your, your age is there. So you're, um, 61 it's down as 61 if you are 81 you are just 80 plus um, and what the sort of people that did the analysis is they just gave everybody over 80 a random precise age value um, and yeah you just sort of go with that you ignore the uncertainty that's there again the said before the sort of gender and race it's not easy to necessarily say that somebody is a white female um, that's not the easiest thing to do. And there's sort of other uncertainty that's there. Um, so the total burn surface area always has to be a precise value, um, despite the fact that it's sort of estimated by nurses and a nurse could be unsure about um, what it should be or different nurses could disagree. Um, and again, other sort of injury status could be unknown. And then sort of finally the outcome status in, in the data set for some cases can be uncertain. If somebody got halfway through and decided that actually their, their data was lost or if they died, um, however they died because of perhaps uh, a complication with the anesthetic, not necessarily a complication because of the burn, then, well, should they be down as survived or died? Is it, it can be more uncertain. Um, and so sort of we can sort of can compute with that uncertainty um, and sort of get get this sort of, again this confusion matrix, um, but as I was saying before, this sort of uncertainty can be can be useful because um, you can look at it and go, okay, so what we want to do is we want to sort of get that specificity as um, perhaps as high as possible, and sort of go, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna up it and assume that um, assume that people who if, if there is any uncertainty that you might be um, might be uh, high risk, then we'll, we're going to consider you um, as high risk. 
um, and you you can sort of look at it and, and compute with that. I'm not sure that that math is entirely correct, but anyway, um, and that that can allow you you to make better decisions um, because you could say, okay, that all the donors are, are high risk, um, and so yeah, and sort of improve it, um, and then sort of the final sort of bit of work that. I've done is this sort of idea of classification sort of without gold standards. Um, so to sort of go back to sort of the compass example, if you've got all these people um, and the red ones are of somebody that have done something criminal um, and you have some sort of profiling tool in order to sort of look at them and go, okay, which ones have and which ones haven't committed a crime, um, then you tool could come out and you could get a confusion matrix that looks something like this. And um, so you've got sort of people that are actually high risk and whether they're predicted. And you look at this, they're okay. So the sense of your specificity at about 90%, that's pretty good. And you think, well, Compass was 60% and that was used in the US criminal justice system. So this sort of fake tool at 90%, yeah, it is wonderful. Um, however, the problem that you have is that the sort of true criminality of all these people um is sort of hidden away and isn't necessarily actually known and all you have is somebody going around that's sort of putting a circle around them perhaps and going okay so these these are the ones that are that are, are high risk those red ones um and then you're sort of drawing up a different sort of confusion matrix there and look it's the same confusion matrix but actually the high risk and the low risk aren't actually high risk and low risk at all um we sort of color them back in with what what their sort of true status should be then you can look okay so that one on the far right side is was arrested and was considered as a red stamp they're a criminal but they're actually not um and that that can matter and sort of that sort of confusion matrix that sort of high risk and low risk compared to sort of actually high risk and actually low risk um is sort of quite different if you look at this this example that actually the specificity is sort of 10 percent worse um because uh, you sort of use the sort of true values instead of the, the the sort of fake values um and then sort of the sort of way that it came up dealing with this is sort of sort of gilding approach um and so you look at that confusion matrix and you replace um replace those components with C boxes um, and then you sort of deal with the, all the C boxes and compute with the C boxes and this is done using this formula um, where sort of five plus is a measure of how good um, the test is at predicting high risk individuals so it, it may be the case that yeah the test is really good at high risk but not so good at low risk um, and sort of a, and sort of ongoing um, and then you sort of compute compute with these values um, and then you work it and sort of five minus is sort of the, the reverse of that. How good is it at sort of predicting low risk individuals that I should say, not high risk. Um, and then, so what you do is you sort of take your um, confusion matrix from before um, and then you go, okay, so what I'm gonna do is replace all those sort of inside values of, of the confusion matrix with the, with its own sort of little C box. Um, and then you're sort of able to compute with that C box. And this is where I ran out of time making these slides. So the presentation ends shortly. Uh, but what, what you can do is you can look at those things and you can come up with um, you sort of your own sort of now sort of C box sensitivity and C box specificity. Um, and what I wanted to show is that actually you can show that these structures have um sort of statistical coverage um however i didn't get time to actually making the slides um which sort of that's why i put this in because i feel like this is um quite relevant for um my uh my phd work um but yeah thanks for thanks for listening if anybody's got any questions comments sledging then let me know well, thank you very much, Nick, uh, for a really comprehensive presentation covering your research and just, yeah, really, really important topic at the moment, very topical. Um, I do have some questions that I might come to. I need just need to flesh out my thinking around it a little bit more, but has anyone got any questions from the audience um, to start us off? 
Oh, it's just a short one from me. Thank Please you go ahead, Adolphus. Thanks so much, Francis. And uh, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, as usual, you know, your presentation has always been enjoyable and I really, really appreciate the content that you have shown us over the last four years. So well done, bro, as always. Um, yeah, no worries. Uh, okay, this is more of a general question. So what's next? Like, you know, like, like what is the, um, like the next course of work that we should like, carry on from, from this? Um... Well, so one of the things that um, when I was doing the sort of work at Imperial that came up is, so there's, well, there's this idea of a sort of explainable AI. Um, and one of the sort of ways of doing that is sort of learning logical rules. Mm -hmm. So for example, you might learn that um, cats like to sleep and dogs like to go on walks and stuff like that um, and so you sort of learn that as a logical rule mm -hmm. so if like to go on walks then dog as it were um, and one of the things that ideas that I came came up with there that I'd like to sort of be the next bit of research in this is to okay so you you have that information but what if you have um, if there is uncertainty there either uncertainty because actually you've only seen two dogs one of them likes to go on walks one of them doesn't so how do you how do you know whether all dogs like to go and walk based off a small sample size or how do you learn learn rules if there is conflicting um information or or sort of really cases that okay so i've i've observed five cats um all of them like to sleep um so how how confident should i be in that rule um and therefore could i come up with a better rule um if i were to say well it likes to sleep and it's um yeah it's like to sleep and it's ginger mm -hmm. therefore as a cat is that better because i've got more information even though there's there's sort of quite a lot of uncertainty that's the the next half-baked idea However, these five unfinished papers need to be finished and submitted as a thesis first. So, <laughs> no worries. No, um, about about what you just explained, like like of course, um, you know, we only have very small, basically like a small data to observe and and you know make some uh, confidence over the, like like you know the results that that you know that's expected from from what you call all these like like machine learning techniques, but yeah, uh, wouldn't wouldn't it be right to also say that you need to have some sort of like prior knowledge to actually you know have an idea of the uncertainty over that small sample space um as in prior knowledge in a in a bayesian sense that you stick a prior oh no i said like like in 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 the uh like let's say you know you observe five cats and they all love to sleep and you know yeah. and yeah, and you to have some sort of like a confidence over this kind of like results to say that oh cats all love to sleep like wouldn't that mean that we need to have some form like prior knowledge of like you know uh of like a general cat behavior and and all that to actually have a confidence on this result to say that okay you know given that I've seen five cats that all love to sleep you know what 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 is the uh the level of confidence that we can have that you know that all cats actually uh, a certain proportion of them behave that way. Well, that's that's the yeah, that's the the research question. What's you have you have the data, you have that logical rule. Yeah. Um. So therefore, what? Yeah. So you, so you have that logical rule. You know that you know that cats do behaviors A, B, and C. Yeah. But actually, you've only observed three that do all A, B, and C. A couple do A and B, but you don't know about C. Yeah. Um. Is is therefore is that a good logical rule to use or or not? Um, that's the that's the question. Um, nice one. But yeah, it's yeah. But sounds sounds like a good uh, research coming up from you as always. And uh, but thank you so much for your once again for your talk and for addressing our query. I really look forward yeah. to uh, seeing what's next for you. Thank you, Dolphus. Um, Alex, would you like to ask your question? 
Uh, I mean, it is basically just kind of following on the same thing. Uh, I, I, I also think it's a really, really interesting idea because it does seem that uh, as someone kind of looking at machine learning, it does seem that a lot of the issues stem from finding the most likely classifier for a given data set and then going with that as the result. And then problems stem from the fact that, well, if you've got a lot of other potential candidates, uh, how are you justifying rejecting cats in favor of dog? But maybe you could, um, with the C boxes, you could assign a level of confidence to the statement of like cat, not dog, or dog, not cat. And naturally, you'd be limited in your ability to assign degrees of confidence based on the amount of data you've got. But I, I think, yeah, it's it's one of those that it's a really interesting question that the, we need to address at another point and finish. Yeah, the big, the big thing that I that I came up with that was that actually you have you have this problem of that if you have a rule that cat if a and b. Um, and then cat if A and B and C, then actually how do you say that the, the A and B rule is better than the A and B and C rule, given that there's dependence there, there's different sample sizes, there's different, um, there's all these different things. Um, how, do you, how do you say one is better than the other is, a, a, is yeah, an open question and mm. one that would be good to solve. Yeah, I guess like the, the question that I had has kind of been answered already. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, so my question, uh, Nick, is I would, I'd like to understand your, your thinking a little bit more if you could summarize it in a, a couple of sentences really around for exa the example that you gave when you're talking about the kind of racial biases when they're assessing the, the risk of um, a white person or a black person in terms of their, their criminality and committing um, a particular crime. How would you yeah. kind of compensate for that sort of risk? Like what would that look like to have an algorithm that could compensate for the systemic bias that they were incriminating more black people than white people, for example, say in the USA, I imagine that might have been that particular yeah, might have been in so the USA or something. But like obviously the data that you've got, if you've got crap data going into the, the training the algorithm then the result is going to be biased like do you have any idea how you would incorporate in precise probability into having a more fair humane algorithm in that um, sort of scenario it would be this well i think there's two things that you could do one is to um deliberately um censor the data in order to be well, because the sort of problem that you that you get is that actually, so you have this information, um, and then if you think of it as a, a a crime case, that very often the the race is there, the age is there, the gender is there, but actually the the postcode that they live in is actually points to that that information. If you are white, affluent. And in your fifties, you probably don't live in a small city centre apartment. Right. You probably live in the suburbs. So that that points to that. Um, so there is a, a question of: Do you um, sort of deliberately sort of censor the data and intercalate the data in order to try and protect that information whilst keeping the the model working? Um, that's something that I had planned to research, um, and that research was going to be um, with um, Vladik Kronovich in Texas, and I had the trip to Texas booked for a month, and oh, then okay. COVID happens and it stopped, yeah. and then that idea is, is sort of never sort of um, grown. Yeah. Um, however, the other thing that you that you could do is this um, this gilding idea. If you you sort of looking at okay, so how good is this? Is the only data set that I've got, um, and therefore this is the only 
machine learning model that I can make, but I know that the I know that the confusion matrix that I get out is is wrong. Um, so therefore, actually, can I come up with some way of assessing what the performance of my initial classifications were, and therefore I can come up with a way of sort of yeah sort of building it and making it into sort of uncertain structures and therefore you have that uncertainty and if you are um if you are somebody and for whatever reason that it's sort of yeah quite quite wide um quite wide intervals and so you could look at it and go actually the the sensitivity is really uncertain given i don't think the data is very good um so therefore i don't think i can trust it or um, it, it could be the opposite. You could look and go, okay. So, despite the fact that I think that the um, method isn't very good, the specificity is still really high. So, I'm yeah. happy with it because, in a criminal sense, I don't necessarily mind a load of people yeah. being perceived as high risk, um, because you don't want that one to slip through the net. Yeah. So yeah. I, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's just it's a really important thing that's going to become more and more of an issue as algorithms start to become more embedded in, say, law and, say, medicine, because obviously there's different races and different kind of like um, kind of typologies or demographics and having something to compensate for that. Then it, there, there just must be a better way. And I think imprecise probability definitely is a more fair comparison, but it just to have a humane algorithm, I feel like you just you can never really get rid of the human aspect of it you can never just rely solely on the stats to make those decisions so no um, I, um, and and you have to say, it's really up to the human at the end of the day is is the yeah. most uh, important thing uh, well and you have the let's not forget the thing that's really going to deal with this is who is um sort of legally liable for mistakes mm. that's going to be the yeah the key the key thing yeah, I just hope they don't offload the responsibility slash liability on an algorithm as opposed to someone that has to make the decision in that sense. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions from the audience? And if not, then let's wrap up. So thank you very much, Nick, for sharing your your work your presentation your research really really important stuff and an immense amount of work you've done so really well done and um good luck writing writing it all up for your your thesis um so yeah cheers thank you very much it seemed very finished and complete to me it, it didn't to me when i was having an existential <laughs> crisis about it last <laughs> night but anyway yeah all right so take care everyone um and if anyone wants to follow your work nick just could you let us know where people can find you? Um, you can, yeah, the, well, my email address will be on the RISC website, I assume. And there's a yeah. research gate. Research. Yeah, I have a research gate that I think is up to date. So, okay. Yeah, so people can find you on Nicholas Gray on research gate if they want to see your publications. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Perfect. All right, thank you very much, everyone, and um, see you next week. Bye.